Folks, we're back. This is Steve Sanson, our special guest host, Stephanie Phillips with Veterans in Politics. Today, our guest is going to be Amata, Amata Amoya Radawagon. She is the congresswoman representing the American Samoa. But before we get to our guest, Stephanie, do you have any rants? I do. I had a hard time deciding what to talk about this morning. Okay. <laughs> because there's so many things we could rant about. I think the top thing is the $1.5 trillion omnibus bill that they just passed mm. in the middle of the night. Mm. And by 2.30 in the morning, they voted on it. And then the Senate just approved it yesterday. And in that they're funding 13, 14 billion to Ukraine to, defend their borders when they're not defending our southern border. And there's a lot of social things that are in that bill, to my understanding, that further put people um, dependent on the government mm -hmm. instead of independent. And um, I don't believe that they should be voting on these things in the middle of the night. And the other side doesn't get a chance to read it. debate these, read it. Nobody read that. It was a 2,700-page bill. Um, the text didn't come out until after it was already approved and voted on, to my understanding. And I'd like you to weigh in on this and let us hear what you think of all of that, how the Rules Committee handled that. Um, okay. So that's probably the main thing other than gas prices, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have any rants today, or at least not on this show, but... But um, let's get to our guest, Congresswoman Radawagon. Yes. Could you give us a bio, please? Well, I guess we'll hold off on answering uh, Ukraine. I am, uh, my name is Amata Radawagon. I'm the uh, U.S. Representative for American Samoa. And uh, I am in my fourth term right now. Wow. I'm the only woman ever elected uh, to that office from American Samoa. We are, tend to be a society that uh, uh, is somewhat uh, male-oriented. Mm -hmm. And so that is changing little yes. by little. And so I've, I've done a number of different things in my life, and one of the which is uh, the importance of veterans. My own father was a World War II veteran and his own father was actually a World War I veteran. And so uh, veterans are very important, not only to, to me, but to American Samoa as well. Uh, almost 10% of our population is veterans. And almost 10% of our population is active military. Wow. So these are very important people to us. But... Um, in terms of your question, Stephanie, with regard to Ukraine, you know, as a country, we stand together and we strongly support Ukraine. The United States and Europe can provide important diplomatic, economic, and humanitarian aid. And thank God we do not have to send our young service members from the U.S. and American Samoa into the war. And what Congress and the U.S. can do is help with medical supplies, humanitarian relief, urgent diplomatic pressure, military strength protecting nearly uh, nearby uh, NATO allies, and direct economic assistance. We can make sure they aren't closed off from the world. And, you know, Putin needs to know the world is watching and watching carefully, and we are all fully united against his aggression. The Ukrainian people have responded with great courage I have to take my hat off to all of them. They're making a strong stand. We pray for all of them, especially the, civ the civilians and the children getting caught up in this war. Very good. Now, how long we've known each other now? It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. So. You first took off this one. In 19, in 2014, okay. I should say that. Uh, you went prior, up against an incumbent. Yes, and his nickname was Unbeatable. <laughs> but I should back it up and and uh, and uh, let you know that 
I ran 10 consecutive times prior to that and I lost each and every one of wow. those times. So by the time uh, 2014 rolled around, after all, I first started running in 1994. And by the time 2014 ran, ran came around, uh, the incumbent ran and God was very good to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were nine candidates in 2014. And so when the dust cleared, uh, and people said that I had won, I thought they were kidding me because they were so used to me not winning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't think it was really very funny of them. But they said, no, you, you actually. So I came up with 42% of the vote. And then two years later, I ran again. And God has been very good to, to me and to the people of American Samoa. We came up with 75% of the vote. Two years after that, in uh, 2018, I came up with 82% of the vote. And in 2020, you God blessed us up, huh? with uh, <laughs> almost 85% of wow. the vote. So, but I think the thing is... So let's go with 100% this time. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I can only just do the very best. And for us down in American Samoa, degrees and things... They count to a certain extent, but really how nice you are. Mm -hmm. And that's it. People say, well, what should I study uh, to, I want to run for Congress one day. I said, well, I had never even thought of running for Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just something that came along and over the years, helping the community in any way that I could. And when they asked for help, always helping. And, and really just being nice to people. Mm -hmm. Treating people the way you yourself would like to be treated. That's my secret. And that's it. It's not, not even a, a huge secret. And if, I think people, if they can figure that out, we could probably have a lot more uh, good people Running getting office. into office. Yeah. So you, you just, thank you for coming on the program. I understand that it was a long trip from America to Samoa to get to Las Vegas, Nevada. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, you landed yesterday, right? Yes. I did. It was an overnight flight, and I uh, got right in at 4.30 in the morning and then had to run over to the other terminal with my hand carried, and off I went to make the flight it's nonstop from Honolulu to Las Vegas. And so here I am. Were you wearing your Air Jordan time. sneakers? <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are really very interesting shoes. They are actually, uh, they come from Switzerland. And uh, all I can tell you is that I rely on them a lot. I believe in them. <laughs> and uh, so, but. So Congresswoman Radawagon. Yes. What boards and committees do you sit on currently? Well, uh, right now I'm on the House Veterans Affairs Committee mm -hmm. where I'm ranking member for the uh, full committee. Okay. And uh, I'm on two or three subcommittees all very relevant to our veterans. Mm -hmm. I'm also on the uh, Natural Resources Committee, and uh, I'm vice ranking member for insular uh, areas on mm -hmm. natural resources. And natural resources is the committee that has jurisdiction over American Samoa. And part of my responsibilities also have to do with the um, Native American registered tribes mm -hmm. all over the country. And uh, as well as the freely associated states. This is a part of the world that um, the United Nations had turned over to the U.S. to kind of look after after the war until they could determine what they wanted to do. So that whole area of Micronesia. Mm -hmm. So since then, they have been split off by the decision of their own people. Mm -hmm. And so we address those concerns also on the Natural Resources Committee. As a as a as a member of Congress, explain the job description that you hold um, representing American Samoa. Exactly, um, you vote on you don't vote on the floor, but you vote in committee. Explain so people could understand because everybody America Samoa they got a congresswoman there, yeah, isn't that a territory? So some people don't understand that yes. that that territories have representation in Congress. 
So could you explain a little bit so people could understand? Yes. Well, I, I think that not too many people realize that those of us who are uh, representatives in Congress from the U.S. territories, we get just about everything the, the members from the states get. The only thing we do not do is we do not vote in final passage of a bill on the House floor. And so legislatively speaking, by the time you reach that stage of the game, everything has been, all the wrinkles have hopefully been smoothened out and so forth and so on. So, but that is a constitutional issue, which sometime might be taken up in the future. But right now, uh, I get the same budget as a member from California, Alaska, New York. What is your budget? <laughs> well, it, it, it varies from year to year, but it's okay. really only a million dollars, somewhere around there. Oh, well. And uh, w when you have a situation like I do, where we are seven time zones, Washington is seven time zones in front or ahead of my home district. Mm -hmm. We're, we're really up half of the night, you know, um, while the others are sleeping. Right. Uh, some of us are still awake dealing with the home district. But it's all good. I uh, love my work. And let me just uh, uh, expand a little bit on your question there. So uh, we can do things such as actually a member from the territories can run for speaker. If they get enough votes, they can do that. You can manage a bill, introduce a bill. You can have a colloquy, which is a discussion with the House member or members right on the House floor. Mm -hmm. So all of these things um, can be done. And um, so we fully utilize <coughs> everything mm -hmm. in that toolkit. <coughs> and I have done this for the past way too many years, and I'm willing to admit <coughs> but I've been able to link together these different network systems that I've uh, worked with over the years. And, and that's how we get things done for the people of American Samoa. But uh, the short answer is my job is to convince 440 other members of Congress that my home district is the most important home district in Congress. How did that go? <laughs> I do it every day. And uh, you can take a look at some of the things that we've been blessed with, uh, with regard to the benefits mm -hmm. and uh, uh, some of the uh, bills that I've uh, sponsored and co-sponsored uh, for the people of American Samoa and for veterans in particular. Sure, I, we would love to hear what bills you sponsored and co-sponsored. Well, let's see. Let me tr just try to... Uh, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I want the veterans to know that they are always in the front of the line, not the back of the line. Okay. And uh, let me just try to say we, we did pass into law H.R. 1276, that is strengthening and amplifying vaccination efforts to locally immunize all veterans and every spouse act. And that was just to make sure veterans and their families had every opportunity and access and were not left out or forgotten somehow. For our elder population, veteran or not, the best understanding we have is that the vaccine makes a strong statistical difference for that group, most of all, in preventing death, serious illness, hospitalization, or the need to be on a ventilator. And uh, I myself took the vaccine and booster on the advice of my doctor, and uh, so did my, my family. And I didn't get into this job because I thought it would be easy. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic sort of came in and took over the agenda and changed everything. And that changed the news and it also affected legislation. So during these times, I want to stay focused on working hard on making improvements to veterans care and benefit, whether or not we return to normal.
I'd like to talk about some of the primary. I still want to stick to the vaccine for a little bit, Mm -hmm. Congresswoman. Do you think the vaccine should be mandated in the military? Personally, I don't think it should be mandated Uh, for myself. It should be a personal choice. Yes, it should be a personal choice. And I made that choice for myself. Right. And the members of my family did the same thing. It works for us. Okay. And uh, so. uh, What else do you have? Well, um, I think that always at the head of my agenda is the issues affecting the veterans in American Samoa. And uh, the main issue currently dominating the conversation is the this whole situation with the vaccine. Okay. Now, as you know, for the last two years, we were completely COVID free mm-hmm. until about a few weeks ago. Then uh, there was one positive case, another positive case. Right now, I think that at the last reading, we have about 433 positive cases. And about six people. These are people in Congress? In American Samoa. Oh, American Samoa. Yeah, just American Samoa. We were the last in the United States to even get a single COVID Did you bring it over there? (laughs) (laughs) No, I went down there after it had already arrived. (laughs) And I went down uh, a week ago, and it was really on a military aircraft with uh, FEMA. FEMA was heading up the mission. And along with uh, experts from CDC, the U.S. Public Health Services, uh, the Department of HHS, and... Uh, What's HHS? Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, oh, okay. under which all of this, it is the umbrella organization for it. And so we took all these experts down there to try to see what could be done to combat or deal with the COVID spread that's happening in American Samoa. But I mentioned about the six people who were in the hospital, Mm -hmm. and now three uh, three of them have already been sent home. Okay. So no deaths. No, there have been absolutely no deaths. Mm -hmm. But I think, and what a country, you know, what a country. I can tell you that much. They sent all these people down, and we took this team down. They are down there. They'll be down there for as long as it takes, maybe up to a. A couple of months. Mm -hmm. We also had the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers looking into our hospital because in the back of my mind is to get a brand new hospital for the people of American Samoa. So there's no VA hospital there? No, we do have a CBOC down there. What is a a, CBOC? We have a veterans clinic down there. And that that clinic was named after my predecessor. You 20 percent of veterans or in American Samoa, twenty percent of the population are veterans in American Almost ten percent, yes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then you got another ten that's active. That's right. Yeah, you should have a VA hospital down there. You well, know what Shelley Berkeley did and forced the issue. Yes, <laughs> that's true. We are. Believe me, we're working day and night okay. to force the issue. And and the thing is that it is very uh, to have a code compliant hospital. Now, mind you, this hospital we've had it's fifty plus years old. Mm-hmm. And things get worn out after yes. that length of time. Yeah, like me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we've been able to um, get the Army Corps of Engineers. The U.S. Senate asked for a report mm-hmm. on our hospital, and uh, it was declared by the Army Corps of Engineers to be in a condition of failure. Mm-hmm. So we are moving as fast as we can to try to rectify that situation. The way I see it is everybody who has something to do with American Samoa's veterans Mm -hmm. and the hospital, they can all put something in the pot. And I think it basically would be the Department of Defense, Department of the Interior, and uh, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And then, of course, the American Samoa government, they could throw something in the pot and and it'll co- it will roughly cost nine hundred million dollars for a cold compliant brand new hospital. So we're trying to wow. make Almost it as a billion dollars to build a hospital. That's right. And oh. so uh, it's like one of our casinos here. <laughs> yeah. Well, for too long, I think what we've been doing is just putting Band-Aids on our hospital now. Mm-hmm. But uh, And I want to commend the governor and lieutenant governor of American Samoa. They've been working very hard. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Governor Limanu Maunga and Lieutenant Governor Talawenga Ale for collaborating mm-hmm. with FEMA 
the lead on this whole thing, FEMA and all these other federal partners who are now in American Samoa uh, doing their best to uh, right. deal with the COVID situation. Stephanie? I have a question about veterans. Um, I was reading the other day, and I didn't know the statistic, but about 8,000 non-U.S. citizens join our military each year. They have green card status, but they join, they spend decades in the United States. And then once they're honorably discharged, sometimes they have misdemeanor charges against them and ICE deports them because of these things. And ICE, as of 2019, didn't really know how many veterans they were deporting out of the United States for, you know, these small infractions. Do you think that once they serve our country and honorably and should they be granted automatic U.S. citizenship after that? There's a very, that's a very good question, Stephanie. The fact of the matter is there are two Samoas. There is American Samoa, where we are part of the U.S. So we cannot be deported. We are not deported. But um, those who may have joined who originally came from the independent state of Samoa, they may have issues like that that confront them. And uh, so I do think that um, my staff and I, we do everything possible to work for all Samoans. Our top priority is American Samoans, but there are, it's interesting because the Secretary of State came down to American Samoa and I was at the airport to greet him. This was a few years ago. And he said, so tell me, how many constituents do you have? And I said, about 700,000. He says, 700,000? There's no way you can fit 700,000 in these little islands. And then I said, well, fact of the matter is, there are about 700,000 Samoans in the entire world. We're a very small population. And the fact of the matter is that every Samoan, no matter where they're from, they think I am their member of Congress. Now, I was up in Alaska. Well, let's say I was up in another state where the member of Congress was uh, from that state. He and I were doing an event. So a Samoan chief came over to me and asked if I would take my picture with him. And I said, sure. And uh, there's also the member of Congress from this state is right here, and he can be in the picture. And so the chief said, but I don't want him in the picture. And I said, how long have you lived in this state? And he said, 30 years. I said, well, he is actually your member of Congress, and I'm sure he has a lot more power than I do. And then the chief said, oh, no, no, you are Samoan, I'm a Samoan. You are my member of Congress, and that's all there is to it. So yeah, I wanted, that was my answer to the I'll, Secretary of State's question. I wanted to piggyback on Stephanie's question. If, if, there, was a, <clears throat> if there was a bill in committee that said um, if, 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 a, if a green card citizen um, enters our military and uh, and uh, serve honorably, and comes out of the comes out of our military and have a little bump in the law. Um, do you think that um, the green card um, Ameri a green card holder that served in a U.S. military should automatically have American citizenship? Basically, well, I think that. Uh, uh the USCIS and the Department of State, they have addressed all those questions and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd be certain, I'd be delighted to look into it. But uh, we've got a great country and uh, there's no greater sacrifice than uh, to make the sacrifice for your nation. And I think that all of that ought to be taken into consideration with regard to each and every one of these cases. Okay. Do, do you see, do we have a veterans treatment court here in the state of Nevada, <clears throat> and the way it works, it's, it's supposed to help um, treat our veterans instead of incarcerating them. Because, you know, a lot of veterans come back with post-traumatic stress disorder, combat scars, or 
um, traumatic brain injuries. Um, do you think that a, a nationwide um, um, mandate, so to speak, that to, to tell all states that they need to have a veterans treatment court to treat veterans instead of incarcerating them? Do you think that some, you'd be on board for something like that? I'm always on board for helping veterans. And if something needs to be done legislatively, then it may be something that could be done in Congress. It would certainly have to be looked into. Okay. But uh, I think that any way we can say thank you to the veterans for their sacrifice, okay. we have to take a look at in a serious way. There, there is a, another um, veterans thing that that we're trying to work on um, because when you're in the military, because I served 12 years in the military, six in the Marine Corps, six in the Army. But when you're in the when you're in the military, there is no transition and out of the military to civilian life. You know, as a Marine, they they take a civilian, they break you down, they make you, you know, a combat soldier or whatever you want to call it. Yes. But but there's no reverse play. There's no taking this tough Marine and trying to transition them back into civilian life, like uh, how to do resumes and, 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 and how to adopt, adapt to civilian life. Do you think that there's a transition program in the Air Force, but the, the Marines, the Army and the Navy doesn't have one. Do you think that there should be some type of transitioning program six months before you get out the military that you go into this program, kind of transition you back into civilian life? Do you think you'll be on board for Isn't something like this? Isn't that the TAP program? Oh, uh, the it's thing a TAP that, program? What is that? It is basically there to help the uh, veterans uh, mm -hmm. as they make that the transition. Program. But uh, I could send you more information on that. Uh, the thing is that veterans need to be helped in every way possible. And uh, I meet with veterans all the time. And one of the first basic things I tell them is, when you know you're going to retire, make sure you get two copies of every piece of paper, every important document that you have. Mm -hmm. Too many of them are retiring or leaving and mm -hmm. then goodbye. And then maybe 10 years later, uh, they no longer have their DD-214. <laughs> the federal government cannot move forward on any request without that DD-214. And then they come to me and they say, well, I need my DD-214. Where is it? Mm -hmm. I lost it. When? I don't know. I never got a copy of it. <laughs> well, okay. You've got to just make sure you have that portfolio. It's pretty simple. Right. And it's, it's a big help to the veterans. Not only that, it helps those of us, public servants, who are trying to make your case for you right. when you leave. Okay. So what other boards do you sit on, Congresswoman? Well, I, I don't really sit on boards per se. Okay. Uh, Congress is kind of uh, strict about uh, us belonging to boards and things like that, but that's just a matter of semantics, you know. Yeah. But I, I do help groups wherever I can and wherever it's within my strength okay. to do it. Stephanie? I'd like to go back to your bio for just a second. Um, you said you ran 10 times before you one. I did. And then you're running again your fifth time, the fifth term next time? Yes. So that's a lot of determination. So what motivated you initially to get into politics, to start running, and to continue and run that many times? Well, part of it also is, is that I think I, I come from a family that has kind of a legacy of uh, leadership and public service out in those islands. My uh, aunt, she was his, the oldest sister of my father. She was the first woman, Samoan woman, ever to be popularly elected to our local House of Representatives. And that was back in the late 40s or early 50s. And so she was a trailblazer right there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my own father, he was the public defender of American Samoa and went on to become the first Samoan attorney general. Oh. And then he was the first. At that point, we did not elect our own governor, uh, but uh, he was appointed by President Eisenhower. 
And uh, to me, I always believed that that was kind of a catalyst that served to maybe motivate the other island groups into moving in kind of a direction of self-government. Because prior to that, no native-born or indigenous person, it was just unheard of in those times that they would head up a government. You know, I think the, for lack of a better term, the colonial uh, governments felt that we couldn't take care of ourselves that well. So President Eisenhower just decided it was time to let an indigenous person do it. And he uh, appointed a young uh, 36-year-old World War II uh, veteran to do this. And that man ended up not only being the first and only appointed governor, but the first elected governor. And he went on to serve a total of 16 years as governor of American Samoa. Now, in addition to that, he also became the chief administrator for the Marshall Islands. Today, they call that, that person the president of the Marshall Islands. He also held that same position in the Northern Mariana Islands in Saipan. Today, that person is called a governor. So uh, you can see that um, the theory that indigenous people can head up their government has um, been proven to be a, a pretty good good idea. It was all in the family. It's in the blood. Do you have anything else for the congresswoman? Well, I was going to ask one more thing about our southern border and what you think should be done down there to protect our borders. The borders need to be secure. Right now, it's hemorrhaging at the borders. Yes. And... Uh, that's a huge shame. Uh, not only have I traveled to the northern, uh, the uh, northern triangle countries, and I've been in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, and I've also been to the border towns there, McAllen, Texas, and uh, I've, I've been there when the people were just streaming in, and so we have got to do something about it. It's it's really it's a shame. Second What's happening? Yes. What are all the U.S. territories in Congress? We've got uh, five of them. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Virgin Islands. You're from the Virgin Islands, aren't you? Jamaica. Ah, uh, close. <laughs> okay, so there's the Virgin Islands. Quick Island. swim. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, the District of Columbia is a, is a U.S. territory mm -hmm. in terms of legislation and right. things like that. They can't uh, be a state. They want to be a state, and they can be a state, but it, it just depends on what right. the, not only what the people want, but... I thought um, the Constitution prohibits well, them being a state. Well, but constitutions can always be True. modified. True. It depends on whether you have the support for it or not. True. So th they are pushing to be a state. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, there's American Samoa. I hope I haven't left any out. But the interesting thing about all these other U.S. territories unlike American Samoa, is that these other U.S. territories are war, spoils from the war or, mm -hmm. or purchased or something like that. The Virgin Islands, for instance, was under Denmark mm -hmm. until uh, Denmark uh, and the United States decided that um, they would be turned over to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, the Northern Marianas used to be under Japan. Guam used to be under Spain and Japan, and uh, Puerto Rico, Spain. And, and so they all started out with other countries. Right. American Samoa was never in that situation. We were just minding our business. <laughs> and uh, Mind your own business. <laughs> Washington came along. They, they fell in love immediately. We have one of the greatest uh, deep water natural harbors in the entire Pacific, if not the world. And the U.S. was very interested in that. They came down and they met with our forefathers mm -hmm. and said, would you like to join us? And that's really how we became part of the United States 122 years ago. Oh, wow. We looked at it and our forefathers said, well, you're pretty big. We're pretty teeny. But yes, we think we'd like to join you. However, this is what we need out of you. You need to take care of the education of our children, their health care, and you need to... Make sure that our language and customs 
are maintained. And so the United States has a customized agreement with each of these U.S. territories. They all have different needs. Right. And that's what American Samoa had. And today, we are uh, proud Americans and proud Samoans. Our most uh, important uh, secular holiday every year is Flag Day, every April 17th. And that is when we celebrate the first raising of the United States flag in American Samoa in 1900. So some say we're, we're more American than some of these other Americans who are out there doing all sorts of not very nice things sometimes. I notice there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, um, people that, uh, that are born elsewhere and came to America and joined our military are more patriotic yes. than actual people that are born in this country. Yes. Yeah, that, that, you know, that cherish the American flag more than the actual people that are actually born here. Because yeah. sometimes I think they're more entitled. Sometimes the converts <laughs> become much more yes. uh, disciplined about that whole yes. thing than the people who have had it all along. Right. They, they say that uh, once something is taken from you, that the time, that's the time when you realize that how important it really was. Yeah. When it's gone from you. Yeah, when it knocks on your door, then, exactly. then, then that light bulb comes on, right? <laughs> so, Congresswoman, did we, did we cover everything you'd like to cover? Well, I think so. And I want to uh, thank you very much for this important opportunity. I'm always a big supporter of veterans and anything I can do uh, to uh, lend to that effort. I'm right there. Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman. We appreciate you coming all the way from American Samoa to come to Las Vegas, Nevada to be a part of this broadcast. Thank you. Jim. Some people live around the corner and they can't even get here. <laughs> <laughs> Traffic is terrible. I can't get there. You came all the way from American Samoa, an 11-hour flight just to be here. We really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so God much. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Folks, that's uh, Congresswoman... Amata Amaya Radawagon from the island of American Samoa. She represents the American Samoa in our United States Congress. Um, she's going to be on the ballot in uh, an American Samoa, and we wish her well. And uh, we don't think that uh, that uh, she's going to have a problem um, preserving her seat for the next two years. This is Steve Sanson and Stephanie Phillips with Veterans in Politics. Until next time.